Welcome to another episode of the Svarim Chatter Podcast. I'm Nachi Weinstein. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Mosaica Press, who is currently running a 50% off sale on many titles. You can see the link in the show's notes below, or you can go to mosaicapress.com slash sale. Also on new books and non-sale items, you can get 15% off with the code CHATTER, C-H-A-T-T-E-R. There's a number of really interesting new titles, including a book on a film by Rabbi Yisrael Kohn. I had him on the podcast previously, and Mr. Shem hopes to do an episode on this book. So you can check it, use the code C-H-A-T-T-E-R for an exclusive 15% off. This podcast episode is also sponsored by the Toro Graduate School of Jewish Studies, a leading academic program in Jewish studies that equips students with the tools to search out their own unique path into the study of Jewish history and scholarship. Based in Midtown Manhattan, the Toro Graduate School of Jewish Studies provides students a supportive environment and personal attention from world-class faculty, seminar-style courses, at one-on-one mentorship opportunities and career advancement guidance. Students can study in person or complete the program online from anywhere in the world. The Toro University Graduate School of Jewish Studies offers a Master of Arts degree in Jewish Studies with concentrations in Jewish History and Jewish Education and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Jewish History, Literature, and Thought. The Master of Arts program includes in-person, remote, and hybrid options. Each program consists of a rigorous, well-structured curriculum in which students are able to discuss and debate ideas and delve into challenging texts with professors and with passionate, accomplished peers. Study with world-renowned scholars at the Graduate School of Jewish Studies, including Dean Michael Schmidman and Professors Schneer Lyman, Judith Bleich, Jeffrey Wolf, Susan Weissman, and Donna Fishkin, among, among other respected experts. For more information on admission to the Turo Graduate School of Jewish Studies, including scholarship opportunities, please visit gsjs.turo, that's T-O-U-R-O, dot E-D-U, or call 212-463-0400, extension 55580. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of the podcast or to support the podcast, please email farmchatter at gmail.com or see the links and information in the show's notes below. Additionally, please check out and subscribe to the Farm Chatter WhatsApp community chat where I post about new books, farm and book deals, and so on. Also, the Farm Chatter Substack and YouTube channel. The links to all those are in the show's notes. And please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on your favorite podcast listening platform and enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Farm Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Professor Oded Israeli, who is a professor in Jewish history at the Goldstein Goran Department at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and we'll be discussing his uh, new book, Ramosha Ben Nachman, of uh, intellectual biography uh, from the Ramban, and uh, which is in Hebrew. I should mention that beginning of the book is it written in Ivrit from Magnus Press, but uh, we'll be discussing the Ramban, his life, and the uh, biography. So thank you, Professor Israeli, for joining me. Thank you for the invitation. So let's start off. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay. I was born in Tel Aviv. I studied in Yeshiva and in the university. My PhD uh, dissertation was conducted at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. My main research area is uh, medieval Kabbalah. And in recent years, I uh, have focused on the works of Ramban, in the context of his biography, it should be noted that I am currently a professor in the uh, department which uh, Kabbalah is uh, a main uh, uh, area of, re- of research. Yeah. So, so how did you get to Ramban? Was it because of your interest in Kabbalah that you got to Ramban? Yeah. Uh, you see, at the Yeshiva Bocher, I got to know Ramban mainly through his uh, commentary on the Torah and his works on the Talmud, the Chidushim, and the Milchamot. When I arrived at the Hebrew University, I was acquainted with Kabbalah literature and among other topics, Ramban's Kabbalah. The character of Ramban as mystic and Kabbalist did not fit the character I had acquainted with in the Chidushim in the Yeshiva, an analyst and creative judges, Jewish. I found myself asking myself, it, 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 is it at, uh, at all the same person? How can one understand the two sides that are so different in his personality? This puzzle troubled me and I made the decision to go on the research journey following the walls of Ramban as a whole and in the context of his biography. So before we start discussing Ramban, just a general question on the book, I'm sure a lot of listeners are probably thinking about, there's been a lot of uh, works written on Ramban. 
right? A lot of biographies, <clears throat> written uh, recent ones, older ones. So why why the need? Why did you what well, you know? Why decide to write another one? And what's different about this one? Then you know, there's been many words. You know, Ramban is obviously one of the Gedolei Rishonim, a, a fascinating figure. Everybody wants to know about him. Yeah, uh, you see, my book is not a biography, but an intellectual biography, and it makes the difference. In the various chapters of the book, I try to draw the picture of the history of Ramban's works and his philosophy through the prism of his life story. In my book, I ask questions such as, which works did he wrote in his youth and which in his later years? How are various works related to personal, public, and political events that occurred during his life? Why at a certain point did he move from a work in one rabbinic field to another? Such questions have not been comprehensively addressed so far, and this is what my book tries to contribute to the research on Ramban. Okay, so the first chapter, though, does really discuss Ramban's background, you know, his biography. I think we should start, for those that aren't familiar, with Ramban's uh, basic biography, you know, when he was born, where he was born, who he, he studied under, and his family, and those kind of things. So I'll, I'll give it to you to start off with his basic biography before we get to his works later. So it's just basic biography to start. Okay. Uh, Ramban was born circa 1194 and lived most of his life in a small Jewish community in the city of Girona or Girona or Girona or Girona uh, in Catalonia. I not, don't say in Spain. Catalonia on the Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> which uh, politically belonged to the kingdom of Aragon in the 20th century. Only in the last years of his life, in 1267, did he leave Spain and emigrate to the land of Israel. In the land of Israel, he lived in Acre, and there he also died circa 1270. I say circa, but we don't know exactly uh, when he died. We don't know much about his family, but we know that he had two sons, Nachman and Yosef. We know it thanks to the letters he sent to them at the end of his days from the land of Israel. The former, according to these sources, lived in Catalonia, while the latter in Castile, where he served in the royal court. So, Okay, first of all, you said he served, what was, what was his position? I mean, this is something you discussed, we're going to talk about a couple of things, but what did he do, Ramban, besides for being Ramosha ben Nachman and, and, you know, writing all these svarim and chuvas and chadushim and everything that he wrote, what did he do as, the, as you know, what did he work as, his profession? He was a physician. Ramban was uh, the evidence of this in several places in the answers of his disciples, Rashba, in, in, in particular Rashba. In one of his uh, teshuva answer, while discussing the halachic question of whether it is permissible for a Jewish doctor to engage in a fertility treatment for a non-Jewish woman, this is the question. He testifies to his rabbi. In a site, I, 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 I'm citing it. And I saw our rabbi, Moshe ben Nachman, when engaged in this work with a gentle woman for a fee. Elsewhere, he discusses on the question of the legitimacy of engaging in a magical practice using a lion-shaped amulet for the purpose of medicine. And he testifies that the Ramban himself used this medical practice. I'm citing. And I hear that my rabbi, Rabbi Moshe ben Rabbi Nachman, used to make the form of a lion for his passion, and he was not afraid of anything, nothing. His medical knowledge is also reflected, Ramban's medical knowledge, is reflected in the commentary of the Torah. We have to notice, as part of his tendency to provide natural scientific explanations for the mitzvot, like his scholarly explanations for the forbidden foods or the nida, 
which based on physiological, hygienic, and medical context. So we can determine without a doubt that he was a physician. Okay, so let me go back to two more uh, general questions. General questions on the Ramban is, uh, first of all, his family, that he, his family, I mean, his, his uh, ancestors, were they, was he from a rabbinic family, uh, an elite family, or was he, do we not, was he not? No, he, he came uh, 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 probably from a very rich family, and uh, that uh, Yichus is uh, helped him that he when he uh, uh, need the uh, connections and uh, uh, with the kingdom with uh, 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 James okay, Yaakov James uh, the first. Uh, he uh, was a very uh, a ancient family in Girona. We know it. But we know uh, more of them. And do we know, who did he, who did he study under? Who were his Rebbeim? Who is? Rebbeim. Who did he study under? Who is Rebbeim? Okay. Um, Ramban himself mentions two of his rabbis. One of them is Rabbi Nathan ben Meir, and the other is Rabbi Judah ben Yakar. Both of them are not Sephardic, but from Provence. We do, not, we do not know how much he learned from each of them, but it is likely that he reached most of, the, of his Torah by himself as an autodidact. Anyway, it is quite surprising that you know, a rabbi from Spain. It is unbelievable, you know, but in, in early decades of the 13th century, there were not very many known rabbis in Spain. Compared to, for example, to Provence and Northern France, where at that time there were the fruitful Torah centers of the Tosafists, Balea Tosafot. In Spain, there were only a few such rabbis, like Rabbi Meir Alevi Abulafia from Toledo, Muramban respected greatly, uh, or Rabbi John Agirondi, who was Ramban's cousin. But he, he, it was not Ramban's rabbi either, perhaps to a certain extent on the contrary. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to mention also something that maybe listeners know or not know. His 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 uh, secular name, I guess, was right, Bonastruk de Porta, right? As we should uh, mention that as well. And um, okay, so with Ramban, before we get into what you were just discussing there, that the, the lack of Rabbanim there and that, that led to his commentaries in the riff, we'll get there shortly. I want to discuss something that you open up also discussing in the beginning of the book. I think that's important, is the, I guess, the cultural context in which the Ramban, you know, grew up and he, in, um, in, as you mentioned, in Girona, in uh, Christian Spain versus Muslim Spain and what was going on at the time of Ramban in his youth. And as he got, a, you know, middle age, whatever, um, in that area, and I guess Christian Spain versus Muslim Spain and, and the differences. Yeah. So we uh, have to say that uh, the city of, of Girona, in the region of Catalonia, was, as mentioned, the place in which Ramban lived almost all over his life, culturally belonged to the Christian sphere of influence. But on the other hand, the influence of the Muslim Andalusian culture is also clearly visible in it. And this is largely thanks to the migration movement northward within the Iberian Peninsula after the conquest of uh, 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 the, the South by the al Wahidun movement in the 12th century. And many thanks to the trans translation projects of Western classical works into Latin, that flourished in Western Europe during this period. These translations projects contributed to the accessibility of the best scientific and philosophical works for very wide intellectual circles to whom the Arabic language was foreign. 
one of the works translated into Hebrew during this period was Rambam's Guide of Perplexed. Ramban, Ramban also, ben, also ben, benefited from this project as a physician. He himself probably knew Arabic, but the scope of his mastery of his language was probably limited. Right. Okay, so that, now it goes back, now we can get back to the other point you were making about the lack of the Rabbanim, you know, in, 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 in Catalonia. And I'm, call it, I'm calling it Spain. I know it wasn't Spain at the time of, of when he was growing up. And, but in the previous generations, especially in Muslim Spain, let's call it, there was the Rif and the Rimigash and others. And uh, his first writings, uh, his earliest writings, say from Muhammad Sashem, right, defending the Rif from the Balamar of Zach Halevi and his actually his he um he wrote the riff so to speak he he was mashlim his ashloma and adarim and other things so what is the connection is something you explore in the book the connection between his first writings and the older rabbanim older generations of rabbanim from Spain okay we're asking of the the uh, early writings of him the early writings yeah uh, first, uh, it should be uh, uh, it should be noted that the Talmudic works were written at a very young age. It's a very, very important uh, fact. From his correspondence with Rabbi Shmuel Hasardi, very, uh, uh, who lived in Barcelona, and also from what he uh, writes in the Hidushim, in 1223, 1223, when he was about 30 years old, the book of Hidushim was already published. 30 years old. While the Milchamot preceded the Hidushim, it could be supposed that it was written in his early 20s. First of all, in the Milchamot, to, to your question, in the Milchamot, Ramban responds to Rabbi Zerachia Halevi for his criticism of Harif, Rabbi Isaac Alfasi. Around the same time, he composed another defensive book on the Rif, Sefer Azzechut, where he responds to Rabbi Abraham ben David, the Rabbi Driven, and his criticism of the Rif. At the later stage of his life, he wrote the, wrote the Asagot on Ramban Sefer HaMitzvot, in which he defends the book Halachot Gedolot against Ramban's attacks. Ramban admired the ancient, and now I come to, the, to your question. Ramban admired the, the ancient sages of Spain, the ancient, in his life. He, yeah, anyone, but the, the ancient sages of Spain, especially the Rif and the tradition of the Geonim. He realized that in Spain, the scholars, the scholars of the Torah were diminishing. And on the other hand, a genre of creative scholarship was growing at the same time in Provence and Northern France, Tosophists. He feared the authentic ancient tradition is going to disappear and came to its defense. The attacks of Provencal sages like Raza and Rabad, Rivet, against the teachings of Rif endangered in his eyes not only the status of the Rif, but also the ancient tradition of the sages of Spain as a whole. That's why he came out to protect him. Ramban's adherence to the image of the reef, and especially in his Alachic work, is reflected in a work that came out under Ramban's hands, apparently even before the work of the Milchamot. That is, when he was about 18 or 19 years old. It is the work of completing Ilchot Arif, which included tractates of Bechorot, Nedarim, and Chala, 
These works are compiled, in fact, as an imitation of the Ilkhot Arif, both in the Aramic language and in the style of discussion and conclusion that characterizes them. So that is uh, uh, his uh, uh, affinity to the Arif and the, and the Gonim. Okay, first of all, I'll just mention, you mentioned the Shmuel Ben Yitzchak Hasradi, so he wrote the uh, Sefer HaTrumois. That's, you mentioned that the Ramban was in correspondence with. Now, from there, th- th- these were this farm he wrote in his youth, and then you, we mentioned, I mean, everyone, I guess, everyone basically is familiar with his uh, Chidushim on Gemara, on Talmud. Everybody's familiar with those, that's, a, of course. So that was something he wrote later. Why, I mean, at what point did he kind of transition to writing those? Did he go away from writing kind of about the riff, defending the riff, being master on the riff, and then he went to start writing Chidushim on Gemara. Yeah. Okay. And the Chidushim on the Gemara is the most important, most influential Talmudic work, right? This is actually a, a commentary on the Talmud. By the way, Ramban was also the first used the term Hidushim. We have no Hidushim before the Ramban. He called Hidushim also in the introduction of in commentary to the Torah, on the Torah. Yeah? Um, for the first time, Ramban wrote his own independent treatise, which did not come to defend another sage. But beyond that, also, here too, he gives a special status to the Reef and calls him our great rabbi, Rabbeinu Agadol. He is already aware of the great value of the various opinions and various interpretations of the Talmud. Here, when he comes to in- interpret the Subiah, he also presents the opinions, opinions of the Tosophists and discusses them. Ramban adapts a pluralistic interpretive approach here. He presents in every issue, every surya, all the the, the opinions known to him, whether from sages of Spain, Ashkenaz, France, North Africa, or Provence, and discusses them. At the conclusion of each Discussion is Subya, Ramban makes sure to present his own opinion as well, but gives the reader the space of opinion to judge by himself. From a certain point of view, Ramban's work of the Hidushim is an opposite trend to that of Rambam in his project Mishneh Torah, while the great eagle tries to create a uniform codex of halacha, Ramban in his Chidushim actually wanted to preserve the plurality of opinions and offer them to the reader. Now, how, how, how I guess, how different, how did, how did the Chidushim differ from Ramban's earlier works, from the style and from, from the Mohammed and his earlier works to these were. I mean, not, these are not much later, but from his early works. Yes. Also, yeah. Uh, 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 first and foremost, this is uh, the 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 framework. Is a uh, he, he come to interpret the sugya to uh, by himself. He not uh, committed uh, to defend uh, anyone. He is uh, very free to uh, interpret the sugya by himself. You can see, as I said, that uh, he very admired uh, the Rif, and uh, the Rif is a uh, uh, Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu Agadol, but he is going to uh, make the account by himself. And in my book, I showed that in some uh, Sugiya, some 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 discussions. He, uh, he don't agree with the riff. 
he don't agree with Rif. And he uh, uh, get independent uh, 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 attitude to the Sukhya. Yeah, that's also what I was driving at. Part of, part of it, partly in the question is that he, he originally he's like we, you said earlier, he's defending, he's the staunch defender of the Rif from everybody. And then in this Chidushim, of course, he's not attacking the Rif, but he does have kashas, he does come out with questions on the Rif. It does change a little bit yeah. stylistically. Yeah, um, yeah. You okay. say this is the ideology of the Yath, of his Yath. Yeah. yeah, so so I'll, over here I'll follow the book a little bit. Um, before we get to, before we transition away to his uh, his, his famous, of course, Torah commentary, like you said, he calls it Chedushim, not Pirushe on the Torah, he calls it Chedushim, but your book is, I think, because this takes place in the middle, before that, in between these writings, you do have a chapter on the Maimonidean controversy, not controversy, the, the first controversy that erupts and Ramban's place in there, because he is a key figure in the controversy. So, I guess let's, uh, we're not going to give a podcast episode on the Maimonidean controversy about Rambam's writings now, but if you could just briefly give a synopsis, talk a little bit what happened in very brief, like you do in the book, yeah. and then what Ramban's place in the controversy was. Yeah. I, I need the uh, uh, two hours. Okay. Yeah, at least, at least two hours for that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what we can uh, say uh, in brief on this complicated uh, story. You see, among the Arabic words translated to Hebrew in that period were Maimonides, a uh, uh, guide of Perplex. Uh, Jewish communities in the uh, Christian uh, states uh, were acquainted for the first time with this uh, book, Guide of Perplex. In French, Provence, and Christian Spain, the reaction to Rabbi Moses Ben Maimon's, the Rambam, most challenging text, were mixed. Some communities identify strongly with issues they wise addressed and admire the way they were presented and resolved. Others were horrified by questions the current of the book they viewed as heretical. Rabbi Shlomo Minhar from Montpellier was the one who started the fire. Together with two of his students, he began in 20, 1232, reigning against what he saw as Maimonides and his followers' radical explanation of certain biblical passages as allegories rather than historical occurrence. Maimonides' disciples in Montepler, by the way, one of his uh, disciples, of Rabbi Shlomo's disciple, was Rabbi Jonah Gerondi the cousin of Ramban. Among these disciples in Montpellier stand to respond and disputes spread as each side railed throughout Provence. Feeling the pressure, Rabbi Shlomo sent Rabbi Yona farther afield in France to ask the Tosophists help. As a result, we don't uh, 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 tell is in detail, but as a result, the scholars of Northern France turned their attention to the guide, apparently for the first time. Appealed by Maimonides' devotion to Aristotle, they promptly banned the books and all who studied. The other camp slapped its own ban on all three anti-Maimonides, Rabbi Shlomo and his disciples. Both sides eagerly awaited Nachmanides' opinion. Nachmanides was maybe 40, 40 years old, not more. But Nachmanides was in no hurry to favor either one. 
he he has sympathy with certain criticisms leveled at Jewish philosophers of his era. And in that, in that charged atmosphere, he himself might have objected to Maimonides' more radical positions. With communities howling fire and brimstone at each other, however, he instead sent one letter after another attempting to calm the waters. He opposed the ban on the Rambam and defended his opinions as at least legitimate opinions, even if not always right in his eyes. It appears that Nachmanides, I call it Nachmanides and sometimes Ramban, is the same, the same person. Uh, uh, it appears that, that Ramban original letter succeeded in ending the ban on the book of knowledge and on the guide of perplex. Even if not before, according to some Ramos, copies of the guide thrown to the fire and born in province. That is in a brief summary, but uh, it's a very, very, very uh, complicated story. Yeah, and there's, uh, like I said, a chapter in your book, and there's been much more written about this, and like I said, about the Sefer Mada and then Sefer Mar Nebuchim. Um, uh, yeah, now, now the Ramban, of course, anyone who's learned his commentary on Chumash, in his, uh, he quotes Sefer Moir Nebuchim all over, whether he disagrees with it, or, you know, there's, there's, he has many comments on Sefer Moira in the Chumash commentary. So at this point, before we get to discussing his Bir al like like he called it his Chidushim al and then his other, his other works as well, we'll get to Kabbalah and uh, all his Drushas and Eev and Kehelas and all those other things, but... Why did he, you know, you mentioned this in the beginning, you alluded to this, this kind of change. He was writing all these uh, Talmudic commentaries with the Muhammad Hashem and Sefer Aschus and his, his riff and his uh, and Gemara. And then suddenly now he changes to writing on Chumash and with, with the Kabbalah, the Rechassoid in there and other things as well. What's with, what, why, why the change? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Thank you for, for the question. It's a very uh, important question. Uh, so uh, the turning point was the controversy of Rampa's writings. From some of his uh, letters, we can get the impression that along with the tendency to defend Rambam, Rambam's right to express his views and the legitimacy, the popularity of the guide philosophy in general worried him. It didn't worry him because of its content, not because of the philosophical interpretation of the Torah and the legends of the sages. He was afraid that philosophy would become the most interesting subject and supplant the study of the Torah. Torah in the uh, in the simple sense. Chumash, Mishnah, and Talmud. He felt that the philosophical Beit Midrash, philosophical Beit Midrash, would take the place of the traditional Beit Midrash and the Torah. That is why he felt the need to increase the attractiveness of the Torah. Listen, he turned to compose sermons and commentary on the Torah. In the most important sermon, he delivered, probably in the early 40s of the 13th century, the sermon Torah Hashem Temimah. It means the Torah of God is perfect. He claimed that all wisdom, all human science, sciences can be found in the Torah. Furthermore, according to the Ramban in this sermon, the Torah is the source of all human knowledge whether it is physics, biology, astronomy, astrology, psychology, ethics, religious thought, and Kabbalah. This was also the starting point of his great work, his magnum opus, the interpretation of the Torah, commentary of the Torah. To focus on this direction, which in his eyes was essential, he was 
uh, uh, he should uh, leave his Talmudic work and to turn to new types of works, sermons and commentary. So when did he write the Pirish al And how does he, in, those are familiar with it, but I'll just ask you like this, and you can talk about it. How does it differ, especially from those who came before him? The, the commentary on the Torah. Yes. The Ura Torah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ramban's commentary on the Torah uh, is undoubtedly the highlight of the, his literary work in the second half of his life. This work was one of the most studied and popular biblical commentaries in all generations and served as an authoritative source for discussions in exegetical, halachic, kabbalistic, and philosophical contexts. It was also one of the first Hebrew books printed, by the way, one of the first Hebrew books printed as early as 14. In Rome. Ramban began to work on his commentary only in his 50s, but he actually worked on it until his last day. Until his last day. The unique qualities of the work, to your question, the unique qualities of this work are reflect reflected in the rare combination of historical awareness, scientific and cultural breadth of horizons, and literary and linguistic sensitivities, as well as in a variety of perspectives offered here, exegetical, halachic, kabbalistic, and philosophical. This work marks an important milestone in the history of Jewish biblical commentaries in the Middle Ages. If the commentaries before Ramban focused on the linguistic or stylistic aspects of the uh, of the uh, uh, verb, of the Bible, Ramban was the pioneer of the Jewish biblical commentators who mark, marked a higher interpretive goal of understanding the broad lit literary context, the chapter, the story, the law, etc. He insisted here on marking, marking consolid con 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 consolidated literary units within the literary sequence of the Bible, on bringing an introduction to each and every parasha, and a general introduction to the Chumash, to each Chumash. For Ramban, it, is, it was important to emphasize the structure of the biblical story, the consistency, the chronology. In this context, these principles Interpretive approach is known. Yes, Mukdam or Muhar Batura, according to which there is early and late in the Torah. But mainly the moral and religious meaning of the biblical passage is very important for it. In many places where Ramban dealt with the broad meaning of the scriptures, he allowed himself to deviate from the framework of exegetical uh, study towards a wide-ranging discussion around fundamental theological, religious, and moral questions in which he revealed his religious and spiritual worldview. So we can say that the commentary is not just commentary, comment commentary, but not just commentary. Okay, so before we get a little bit more into that, um, you mentioned that he was writing until his last day, which is, he, he continued writing in Eretz Yisrael. There's actually right, been a volume published, I think just even a second edition of Teisefes Ramban Le Pirusha Le Torah Shenichtu Eretz Yisrael by Yosef Ofer and Jonas and Yaakov, Johnson Jacobs, right? Jacobs, they, they wrote this entire yeah. volume about it. So he, he worked, he continued to work and add on it when he moved to Eretz Yisrael also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in his last years, when uh, Ramban was in Eretz Israel, means uh, 1267 until 1270, and after his commentary on the Torah had already been completed and circulated, Ramban added and periodically sent corrections, glosses, and additions to the compilation. A significant part of these editions is documented in letters 
sent by the Ramban himself to his students in Spain and Italy. These letters have been known for many years, but in recent years, a comprehensive project on this subject was carried out by Professor uh, Ofer and Professor Jacobs, who edited a comprehensive comparison between the early manuscripts that represent the text of the work without the edition, they called Madura Kama, and the later manuscripts that already include the editions, Madura Batra. The examination of by, by Offer and Jacobs revealed the existence of a, a prox, approximately 170 additional uh, uh, editions, which were only included in the editions, the late ones, beyond the documented the, in the list uh, that were known even before. And in fact, we have in total evidence of hundreds of changes, corrections, and additions that Ramban made during his lifetime in his commentary after it had already been distributed among the rabbis. It must be remembered that he did all this during three years. He lived in the land of Israel. So it can be assumed that the commentary of the Torah occupied his intensity in, in, intensively until the end of his days. Now, the uh, other big part of his commentary on the Torah, the Bira Torah, is his Kabbalah, Al Derech Emes, Al Derech Asoid. I think he's the first first one to do this to really go through uh, with this. So, uh, talk, you know, as as you said, also you're a professor of Kabbalah, Kabbalah, is, you know, particularly. So, talk a little bit about. Uh, the Lader Chasoid, Lader Hamas in the Ramban, first in his Torah commentary, and then in general in his entire worldview, I guess. Okay, so I uh, I begin uh, I begin with the general uh, details of the Kabbalah in uh, uh, of Ramban and uh, uh, on the background of uh, uh, is in Gerona and. Uh, after return, uh, I will uh, address address the the, the Kabbalah uh, in his uh, commentary on the Torah. Right. At first and foremost, we must remember that in the 13th century in which Ramban lived, apparently very few Kabbalists wrote Kabbalah books. This was not yet known, and the most authoritative work was the Bahir book, Sefer Bahir. On the other hand, the most important Kabbalistic center during this period was in Girona, Ramban city. We know the Kabbalists who lived there by their names, Rabbi Ezra ben Shlomo, Rabbi Azriel, Rabbi Jacob ben Sheshet, not the Rivash, 200 years later. Hazan, and more. But Ramban was the only Kabbalist among them all who also had important rabbinical and public status. And this probably contributed to the raising the reputation of Kabbalah. We really do not know who was Ramban's rabbi in Kabbalah. My opinion is that he did not have a distinct rabbi and that he, as an autodidact, received the Kabbalistic knowledge from various sources, first and foremost from the Bahir himself, from which he frequently quotes in his commentary on the Torah as a, a midrasho shel Rabbi Nechonia ben Akana. Rabban was the first to compose a comprehensive Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic interpretation of the, on the Torah, and he integrated it into his Torah commentary. He always uses to mark these commentaries with the words and on the way of truth, al at the beginning, or, and then we'll understand, at the end. Why do we do it? And this is, in order to allow those who are not interested in Kabbalistic interpretation to skip over it 
and focus on the commentary of the Pshat. Raman wrote the Kabbalistic commentaries briefly and eludingly in order to avoid theological mistakes. But on the other hand, he wrote them. The fact is that he wrote them. He was the, 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 uh, uh, the first, the first to uh, uh, wrote the Kabbalistic uh, uh, commentary. And hence, he wanted to give them a status that would attract the readership of the Torah commentary. It is interesting that his warning in his introduction, his warning to teach his sacred secrets only oral was not observed already at the end of the 13th century, immediately after the death of Ramban, and perhaps even before, a literary and written genre of commentary on Ramban's secrets appeared. A genre, not one book. The religious and Kabbalistic climate during the period after Ramban's death changed dramatically. And what was previously hidden and kept in Kabbalistic circles now became open and visible to all. Yeah, I think there's actually been, uh, I think the Mosad of Cook, I think, published recently a, a volume of like collection of commentaries on the Ramban's uh, Kabbalah. There's obviously Rebbe Bachia, right? There's others. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned, but that he says he allows people to skip over, yeah, like Art Scroll or the Ramban Taivi or Shalai, and many today that decide to completely skip over the Ramban's uh, Kabbalah yeah. in, in the commentary. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so, so like you said, I think there's one or two chapters in the book that you dedicate to discussing Ramban's Kabbalah and the Kabbalah of Derech MS in the uh, commentary on Chumash, right? Um, okay, so now another thing that you, that you discuss that we can go to in the book that you discuss is Ramban's, I guess, his theology, his hashkafa on the Ramban and Taimiyah Mitzvahs and other things. And maybe over here we should mention also his something we didn't mention yet, his commentary in Iev, Kehelas, Sharagmul, his other works as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Three hours? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I think before you even start to answer, I'll mention, I don't think I mentioned that the book is uh, around uh, 300 and just about 400 pages. And with yeah. with the indices, you know, with the, with, the, with the index and everything, it, it's over 400 pages. So, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. The book is very in-depth. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I can't uh, address the theology of Ramban uh, even briefly, but I, I, I want to say something. Uh, Ramban was the most prominent rabbi who offered an alternative to Ram, Rambam's philosophy. And in fact, to the Aristotelian uh, philosophy, which was popular at the time. The gap between Ramba, Rambam and Ramban is known. And it is reflected in many issues, most of which in the commentary in the Torah. Everyone who studied the commentary in the Torah know that uh, Ramban is uh, the alternative to a, a Rambam a attitude. But the image of Ramban against Rambam, I should say, I have to say, has a bit of an optical illusion. When we examine the broad map of beliefs and opinions in the Jewish world in the 13th century, it seems that the disagreement between Rambam and Ramban was marginal somewhat compared to the distance, be distance between bo both of them and more traditional views. It must be remembered that both Jewish philosophy and Kabbalah were suspected during this period because both proposed innovations in the world of view and challenged the traditional rabbinic world before them. For example, I want to give an example. Ramban and Rambam differed on the question of the reasons of the mitzvot, right? Rambam offered rational reasons for the mitzvot, while Ramban offered mystical and Kabbalistic ones. But, but this, this, this difference 
is much less dramatic than the decision of both of them together, Ramban and Rambam, that there are really reasons for the mitzvot. The, tradi the traditional rabbinic approach until then, as Rashi sometimes reflects it, is that the mitzvah have no reason at all and are, in fact, Gezerat Melech. I think that it, in, in, in that topic, the last word has not yet been said on this subject. But I think that the, the, the uh, uh, right, this is a, a difference, a, a deep difference between Rambam and Ramban, but it's not the main, it's not the main issue, the main uh, 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 gap in the map of uh, the uh, first decades on the 13th century. Okay, so like I said, his other works, you know, uh, I don't know if it, I, we're not going to discuss mainly his theology, leave it to, to, to listeners to read the book. But do you have anything to say, just in brief, about his, his other drushes, Rosh Hashanah, and he has um, uh, Sharag Mul, or uh, mm -hmm. like I said, um, uh, Kehelas, Eev, his other, his other works. Do you have anything to say, mm -hmm. just in brief, about those other works? This? Uh, in other words, uh, I, I can say other works. Ramban uh, uh, wants uh, some of them are, are, are sermons, sermons that uh, he uh, uh, that he said before the in uh, the shul and before the uh, 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 the audience of the shul. And uh, he addresses the main issues that uh, bother, bother the, the, the audience. And the main issues are, if I uh, sum it very, very, very uh, in general, the, uh, The, the 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 questions of uh, Hashgaha, okay, the question of uh, the rewarded of God, the uh, questions of uh, Eretz Israel, the questions of uh, we we see that the the, 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 the the not philosophy issues. That's a very very uh, existential existential uh, uh, issues that uh, bother the the the. Uh, the community, the 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 simple man in the community. So uh, the most of the sermons uh, addresses these issues. Uh, that's in brief. I can't. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So now the the last uh, thing I guess to discuss. So diamond, which is the eighth. Chapter in the book. The ninth chapter is about Eretz Yisrael. We kind of discussed already his commentary on Eretz Yisrael. So I don't know if we'll get back to that. But the eighth chapter is of, of course, I think this is uh, very famous. Is his vikuach, which we have uh, his written uh, written account, but his uh, disputation uh, in Barcelona, his Christian yeah. disputation with the Christian. So uh, you know, talk to, if you want to say the story and talk a little bit about what happened there and wh what he had to say, what happened. Okay. Okay, so in the month of Av, in the year 1263, Ramban was uh, summoned by James I of Aragon, really a, a very uh, correct relationship with him. Not uh, was any uh, tension. Uh, he, he was called by him to represent Jews and Judaism in a public dispute held in Barcelona with local Christian clergy. It was the Dominican uh, uh, in particular. The rabbi's main opponent was Jewish apostate Pablo Cristiani, backed by the head of the Dominican monastic order, Raymond de Penafort. The debate was held on four alternating dates. Eight days later, according to Nachmanides, to Ramban, to Ramban in his book uh, uh, of the disputation, a final session took place in the city's main synagogue 
with James in attendance. Pablo cited the scriptural and Talmudic proof that the Messiah had already arrived. With the Ramban, the constructing is arguments at every turn. Two records of the event exist, a Latin version confirmed with the royal signature appeared soon after the fact, when Nachmanides published his own Hebrew version a year later. The Latin protocol declaring Christian, Christ, uh, Christianity victory maintains that the debate was cut short when Nachmanides used the king's departure from the city to withdraw from competition. Ramban's own report, however, depicts a cordial parting in which James rewarded him with gold and marvel. This debate was the milestone in the history of Jewish Christian polemic, because for the first time, the Christians did not try to attack the Talmud, but rather to prove the Christian truth from the Talmud. Anyway, after publishing his account of the dispute, Manides forced, was forced to escape from Argon and settle in the Holy Land. Aramic in Jerusalem, in, as mentioned, as 1267. Now, after he arrived in Eretz like we already discussed the uh, that he wrote the you know editions and he worked on the commentary. Is there anything else that you have to add about his end of his life in Eretz Yisrael? About the about Ramban's end of his life and what he did besides reworking the Chumash commentary when he lived in Eretz Yisrael. When he lived in Eretz Yisrael, uh, he wrote. I think that he uh, worked intensively on the. Uh, uh, additions to the commentary. That's what Seder Boker, Seder Tzorayim, and Seder Eri. And we have uh, also uh, uh, one more drasha. This, that is the drasha for Rosh Hashanah. This drasha is the uh, the last manuscript. The the latest manuscript that uh, he uh, wrote maybe wrote a, a, a somewhat uh, more but but the, we we have no it but uh, the drasha he, uh, uh, he he wrote it and he said it he said it in uh, uh, probably in the synagogue of Akko Akko. And uh, he uh, right, he addresses uh, halachic issues like shofar, and uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, issues that uh, he uh, addresses in the chidushim and he in uh, 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 decades before, and he. Uh, he addresses uh, 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 also in the drasha of Rosh Hashanah, but uh, he uh, addresses in a very, very uh, 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 unique menu the uh, biblical uh, parasha portion of the Rosh Hashanah and Shofar. It's very unique. It's uh, it's very uh, interesting to compare it what, to what he wrote in the uh, commentary, maybe some years uh, uh, before, but it's very, very, very. And he uh, deal, deals with Eretz Yisrael. He uh, uh, says uh, what he have to say, uh, uh, what he, he, he believe in uh, uh, about Eretz Yisrael. And he uh, says, the 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 same things the same uh, 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 values that he uh, uh, we we heard from him in uh, Catalonia he says in Israel but when he uh, 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 read or when he uh, make a drasha on Eretz Israel in Eretz Israel 
is another taste. Okay, so the final question I would ask you is about is a Ramban's legacy, quote unquote, so to speak. Of course, everyone today still knows of Ramban and his Torah, his thought is, is with us in, in many ways. So I, it's kind of like a funny question, but I'm asking it anyways. And his, his hashpa on future generations and on, and on generations of Rishayim, you mentioned his uh, main Talmud, is the Rajba and many other Talmudim that he had. So, but uh, yeah, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. I, I have to say that uh, already the turn of the 13th century and during the 14th century, is very work gained status among the rabbinical elite. It's, it was uh, uh, was very clear. The Hidushim of the Talmud were cited and discussed at length by the Ramban's colleagues, his disciples, and the students of the students, the disciples of disciples, in the compositions, Rabbi Shmuel Asardi, Rabbi Shlomo Ben Aderet, Rashba, Rabbi Aaron Alevi, Ra'a, Rabbi Yom Tov Ben Avram Alashvili, Ritba, and more. Raman's commentary on the Torah soon gained a very wide circulation, as can also be learned from the large number of early manuscripts of the world that are in our hands. And as mentioned, it was uh, one of the, the first works with books in Hebrew that uh, published can in, um, uh, in, in, in a printed book. Uh, Ahmad Kabbalistic commentary in the Torah gains its canonical status already in the years after his death. And in fact, there is reason to assume that Ramban's character and status also, as mentioned, contributed to the status of the Kabbalah. Ramban's character and religious authority in rabbinic literature are reflected in the unique weight given to his, to his words in halachic, philosophical, and Kabbalistic contexts. Beyond the, uh, uh, the exegetical uh, value as well in the later geographical uh, literature. To some, I think we can say that Ramban actually played a central role in the formation of the mainstream of Jewish thought in the Middle Ages. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, until today, and even today as well. Until today. Until yeah. today. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I didn't mean, yeah, so, so you know, until you were saying otherwise, but yes. Um, okay, so so first of all, a couple of things. I will link to the book in the show's notes from Magnus. I believe even for those listening to this in the United States, uh, Magnus does ship here as well. You can even order from them, I believe, from uh, from Israel. Now, also, I would ask you one more question um, about the editions of the Ramban. So a lot of the stuff we discussed is still the still classic, is still the uh, Kisvei Kitve Ramban from Maslata of Cook by uh, Chevelle, right, edition. And then the Chum, the, the Shas, you have the one, the, the Chidusha Man Talmud, there's the Herschler, Machon Hirschler, I think yeah, some now are Masada of Kuk also. I'm not sure. There's a couple different ones. But what about it? Do you have any other for the Chumash commentary or his other writings? Do you have any specific editions? If, any, if listeners are interested in reading Ramban's own words as well, do you have any specific editions that you like over the one over the other? Mm. Now, I, uh, uh, I, the head of a project of a new edition of Kitve Ramban. It's very Ramban, uh, not including the uh, Perusha Torah, commentary in the Torah, but it's very Ramban, uh, uh, the uh, extradetical and the uh, uh, philosophical, and the drashot, the sermons, the uh, commentary on Job, and uh, so on, and Shara Kmul. And I hope that. Uh, it will be uh, a finished soon. Is that just going to be edited based on manuscripts? Is there going to be uh, footnotes in there? Excuse me? Is it, are you just editing it from the manuscript, from the Kitve Yad? Or you also yeah, 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 yeah. Theory? Yeah, yeah, it's critical edition. It is critical edition. And then including uh, only uh, uh, the... Uh, 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 the 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 manuscripts that uh, belong to Ramban, 
הרבי שובל, included in his edition, some works that are very important works, but it's not Ramban. So uh, in my edition, it will be uh, no there. Okay, sounds terrific. So looking forward to that. And uh, with that, thank you, Professor Israeli, for joining me to discuss Ramban's book.